When I was in middle school, I was your pretty stereotypical weeaboo. Discovering anime in the summer near the end of elementary school led me down a slope that eventually dunked me into the full-on Obsession Canyon. I spent most of my money on manga, begging my mom to drive me to the bookstore every time I had saved up $10 to get a new volume. I watched anime before school on the family computer, back when you could watch episodes in three parts on YouTube, or on the Anime On Demand channel during the half hour between my parents leaving for work and me leaving to catch the bus. I attended my first anime convention during my freshman year of high school and would continue to attend at least one con per year for the rest of my life. But I had an aspiration back then, one that my small group of anime-loving friends and I all shared. At one point, one of them suggested, you know, it would be super cool if all of us were able to go to Japan together. Why don't we try and study abroad there? We had an IB program at our high school and some students in that program were able to study abroad during their final semester of high school. If we did our best and kept our grades up, there was a chance that maybe, just maybe, we could make it happen. It didn't happen. Not only were our grades not good enough to be in the school's IB program, neither our middle or high school offered any kind of Japanese language classes. There was only one high school in the district that did, and when I broached the subject of going to a different high school just to take Japanese classes to my parents, it was shot down immediately and never brought up again. My friends and I still fantasized about it, though, as weeby teens do, but as high school continued, the dream of studying abroad eventually faded, left unrealized and forgotten. I did, thankfully, eventually grow out of my cringy teen weeb phase. Around the end of high school, my anime obsession had petered out into pretty normal I-like-this-thing levels, where I'd watch one or two shows per season and cosplay at conventions a few times a year. But I still had aspirations of going to Japan at least once in my life just to have that experience, you know? And in 2017, I actually did, but not in the normal touristy way. Instead of flying there and visiting for just a few weeks, I ended up uprooting my whole life and moving to Japan for two full years. And I'm gonna tell you all about it. So I lived in Japan for a couple years and I have enough stories for this to be a multi-hour long video, but for the sake of my sanity and spreading things out a little bit, the Stories from Life in Japan saga will be broken up into multiple videos. For this video, I'll mostly be covering the introduction, how I was able to move overseas, the events that led up to it, and what life was like there when I first arrived. So jumping back into it, after graduating college, I wanted to visit and have some fun experiencing a new place. There was just one problem. Well, two, technically. One was money, of course, but the other was that, well, I kind of hate vacations. Okay, hate is a strong word. I don't hate the idea of going to a new place and seeing new things and stuff like that. I enjoy getting to sightsee and experience stuff I wouldn't get to otherwise. What I don't enjoy is how stressful they inevitably end up being. Rushing around and trying to see all the things you wanna see and get your money's worth before flying back home is exhausting. Getting to and from your destination is always super stressful, and I never come back from a vacation feeling like I actually rested. So ideally, if I was going to go anywhere for a vacation, I wanted to be there for long enough that I'd actually get to enjoy everything I wanted to do at my own pace without the stress of a narrow time limit. And that seemed pretty unobtainable given my meager paycheck. I settled into thinking, maybe one day when my friends and I have adult money, we can all go on vacation together and have a grand old time. And the idea drifted off onto the back burner of my brain until it eventually faded almost entirely. But then eventually, a different idea started to take its place. Not long after college, a friend of mine moved to South Korea for a year to work as an English teacher over there. She posted a ton of pictures from her time there, and even after she came back, she talked about how amazing it was spending some time experiencing another culture while also working as a teacher. Around that same time, I was starting to get a bit bored of my current job, and one day, out of curiosity, I started Googling work abroad programs in Japan. There are several different programs that will let you work in Japan as an English teacher, but the one that caught my eye was the JET program. It's the largest and most prestigious of the Teach in Japan programs and seemed like my best bet if I wanted a good experience. I didn't have any professional teaching experience, but my mom was a fourth grade teacher and I sometimes helped out in her classroom. I also had a few years of experience running panels at anime conventions at that point, which is a bit like teaching. Plus getting to actually live in Japan instead of just visiting meant that I would be able to spread things out and experience new stuff at my own pace rather than having to cram everything into a short vacation. 
The biggest hurdle for getting into JET, however, was the competition. They apparently get thousands of applications every year and less than 25% make it into the program. Without any proper teaching experience, I was worried that my chances were slim. But being the overly motivated humanoid bulldozer that I am, I eventually decided that once application season rolled around, I was gonna shoot my shot. And so began several months of research and preparation leading up to JET's annual application season. So let's talk about what the JET program application actually looks like. The first hurdle is the written application. Submitting your school transcripts, proof that you have some kind of bachelor's degree. It doesn't have to be a teaching degree, they just want you to have gone to college. Along with a lengthy application, two recommendation letters, and a written essay called the Statement of Purpose, explaining why you want to do the program. That process starts in early fall and is due around late October, if I remember right, and only about 50% of applicants make it past this stage. Then you have to wait a few months, and if you pass the written portion, you move on to the interview stage, which happens in January, February-ish. After that, you hear back on if you got accepted a few months later in the spring, then you find out your placement a few months after that, and then you leave for Japan around the end of July, early August. So that's almost an entire year of sitting on your hands and waiting on results and stressing out about what happens if you get in and what happens if you don't get in and all those other fun little thoughts bouncing around in your head like a demented game of anxiety pinball. Combined with that stress was the fact that a few months before I submitted my JET application, I got laid off from my job. Kind of. Sort of. So the job I was doing before I started JET was working on art for standardized testing. I was on a two-year contract at the company with full benefits and a good paycheck. So I figured that I would finish out my two-year contract, and if I got accepted into JET the following year, it would dovetail perfectly with the end of my contract, and my contract would end just a few months before I left for Japan. It was the perfect setup. Six months into my two-year contract, I got laid off. My boss didn't want to fire me, but ultimately it was the company's corporate bigwigs looking at spreadsheets and cutting back on the number of people they employed. And since I was only on a temporary contract, I was the first to get the ax. I was very upset considering I had just signed a lease on a new apartment, but luckily they were giving me a few months notice, so I wasn't out of a job immediately. And then, by pure coincidence, one of my coworkers went on maternity leave and my boss convinced corporate to let me stay until she came back to work a few months later. And then that same thing happened two more times. Between a string of coworkers taking maternity leave and my boss being very persuasive with corporate, I was strung along at this job for an extra year and a half after I was supposed to be laid off, which I really appreciated. But I basically spent that whole year and a half not knowing if I'd have a job the next month. And about eight months into that mess is when I submitted my JET application, which added on a whole other level of stress. Because now, instead of just being, oh man, I hope I get into the JET program, it was, if I don't get into the JET program, I'm gonna lose my job and I'll have to move back in with my parents and I'll be a failure and I shouldn't have gone to art school, I should have gotten a regular job, my life is so over after this. That, in my head, every hour of every day for the better part of a year and a half. Yeah, not a fun time. Luckily for me, though, I passed the written application portion and moved on to the interview phase. For the interview, I had to take a full day off work to drive three hours into the city where the closest Japanese embassy was. When you get there, they put all the applicants in a little waiting room, and you think that this is just a waiting room, right? No. The waiting room was being supervised by one of the embassy employees, and they encouraged everyone to strike up casual conversations with the other applicants waiting for their interviews. And I don't have official confirmation of this or anything, but I have a very strong feeling that they were judging us not just on our actual interview, but also on how we acted and conversed in the waiting room as well. Like, there's no way they weren't doing that. Anyway, after a couple of minutes of being as pleasant as possible under the watchful eye of the waiting room coordinator, I got called back to do my interview. And as nervous as I was, I felt pretty prepared. I had looked up a ton of frequently asked interview questions on the JET program Reddit and had prepped responses I could use if they came up in the interview. I was ready for pretty much any question they might throw at me. I walked in, introduced myself, sat down, and the first question they asked me was... So you graduated college a few years ago and already have a career as an artist. Why do you want to throw that away and move to Japan? Ah, well that's a curveball. So I explained my situation to them in pretty basic terms, that I had a career on paper, but in actuality was working a temporary position with an expiration date. 
and that while I knew most people did jet right after college, I felt like I was in a good situation where I would be able to leave my home country for a few years without too much trouble. So far, so good. The rest of the questions were fairly standard. What kind of teaching experience do you have? What would you do if this thing happened at your school? What parts of Japanese culture interest you? What do you hope to accomplish by being on the program? That kind of thing. And then the last few minutes was the Japanese proficiency section. Now, you may be wondering, how much Japanese do you need to be able to speak if you want to do the JET program? Well, in my case, basically none. They judge you based on your teaching ability and how personable you are, not on how well you speak Japanese. Like, they told me this before they started quizzing me. How well you speak Japanese does not affect your chances of getting in whatsoever. In fact, I've heard that a lot of times they prefer it if you speak less Japanese, so your students will be forced to talk to you in English and practice their speaking skills. And that was definitely true in my case, because while I knew a couple of basic phrases and could read hiragana and katakana, my Japanese skills were on the level of an awkward two-year-old. I super-duper botched the Japanese proficiency section of the interview and still got in, so there you go. After the interview was more waiting. Lots and lots of waiting. For context, my interview was in mid-February, and I didn't find out if I made it through the interview until the end of March. I spent that time watching lots of JET program vlogs online, scouring the JET Reddit page, spacing out and staring at the sky while the evil anxiety pinballed around in my brain, etc. Until finally, I checked the Reddit page and saw that the first acceptances had finally started to trickle in. I was working from home that day and kept refreshing my inbox every 10 minutes, gritting my teeth in anticipation, waiting for the results. And sure enough, that very afternoon, my phone buzzed with an email notification. I got accepted. I am pretty sure I started crying immediately and yelling and prancing around my apartment like a startled baby deer. I tried to call my mom to tell her the good news, but my hands were shaking so bad I couldn't even type her number correctly and had to use Siri. I called her and my dad, they called the rest of the family, my mom apparently went yelling up and down the hall at her school that she worked at to let all of her teacher friends know that I'd got accepted. It was a wildly exciting couple of hours. And it was all downhill from there. I got my placement information a few weeks later. I'd be moving to a sunny little prefecture called Shizuoka, a little ways down the coast from Tokyo. Since I'd be moving at the end of July, the next few months were spent prepping for the move. Getting all the paperwork for my visa sorted, going to the doctor for checkups, packing up my furniture into a storage unit, all that good stuff. And then before I knew it, it was time to go. I packed up my entire life into two suitcases, said goodbye to my family and friends, and hopped onto a plane to the other side of the planet along with all the other jet hires. The flight from Texas to Japan is a whopping 15 hours crammed into a tiny economy class seat. I tried to get at least some sleep, but ended up not really being able to. And then when we landed, we got herded off the plane to discover that Narita Airport doesn't have air conditioning. Or at least it didn't in that section of the airport, or maybe it just wasn't turned on that day. Either way, we stepped off the nice, cool airplane and immediately got blasted with 90 degree heat and disgusting humidity. May I remind you, this was in the middle of summer. All the jet folks were directed to different parts of customs since we were all there on work visas, where they took our photos and gave us our Japanese IDs. And then we all got scooted onto buses and charted off to Tokyo for orientation. We were all super jet lagged and sweaty and disgusting, but the hotel they housed us in for orientation was very nice and we were thankfully able to sleep a little bit before orientation started the next day. Once we were in Tokyo, I really wanted to go exploring, but my phone didn't have Wi-Fi, and I was super worried about getting lost and not being able to find my way back to the hotel. So I did a little walking around and went to a convenience store across the street to get some snacks, but I never went more than a few blocks away from the hotel. I also had my first encounter with Japanese toilets at this hotel. All the hotel toilets had bidets and made little sounds when you walked into the stall, like, hello! Yes, welcome to the bathroom stall. I'll be your personal attendant today. Please place thine buttocks upon my porcelain seat. They didn't like actually say that. That was a joke. It was just a bunch of friendly little beeps and boops, but that's what it felt like if you ask me. The toilets also make noises when you sit on them. Like it plays the sound of a pleasant rushing waterfall loud enough to be heard throughout the whole bathroom. Apparently this is to cover the sound of you doing your business. And I thought it was weird at first, but after a few months, I got used to it and started getting self-conscious every time I went to a bathroom that didn't have a noisemaker. 
Like, ew, no, people are gonna hear me pee. Someone play some pleasant waterfall music, please. Orientation started the next day and was mostly spent listening to a lot of lectures about teaching and life in Japan and prepping us for our new jobs. And we were all wearing full suits and they didn't have the air conditioning turned on and it was like 90 degrees and it was sweaty as hell and it was a nightmare, but I definitely stayed awake for all the lectures and definitely didn't nod off during at least a third of them. No, I would never ever do that, no matter how jet lagged I was. <laughs> I did end up getting to explore a bit more on the final night of orientation when a friend with internet service gathered a small group of us and led us on a walking tour across town to a little back alley ramen restaurant. And despite the fact that it was hot food on a super hot and muggy night, it was still one of the best things I've ever eaten. Blows any Texas ramen restaurants out of the dang water. I'm not sure if I'll ever be able to find that place again, but God, it was magical. The next morning, we were gathered together and shipped off to our respective prefectures. Myself and all the new Shizuoka ALTs were grouped together and shoved onto the bullet train, then off the bullet train and into taxis for about six blocks before making it to the Board of Education building. We spent the rest of the day getting more lectures and info before the staff from each of our specific schools came and whisked us away. Some folks had to hop back on the train to get to their specific cities, but I was one of the lucky folks who was actually going to be living in Shizuoka City itself and I freaking loved it. Shizuoka City actually reminded me a lot of the area where I grew up in Austin. It was a city, but it was on the smaller side and still felt quaint and homey even when you went downtown. My school and my apartment were about 30 minutes north of downtown by bike, and I spent a lot of time on the weekends tooling around and exploring down there. My specific neighborhood had everything I needed on a regular basis within walking or biking distance, so I usually just walked to places like the supermarket or rode my bike if I needed to go a little further away. We also had a city bus that I used occasionally, but it was a little on the expensive side, so I only took it if the weather was bad or if I was traveling with other people. We also had a train route that ran through downtown and gave us easy access to Tokyo. Taking the slow train took about three hours and cost the equivalent of 30 bucks, but if you were feeling spendy, you could spend $60 and get to Tokyo on the Shinkansen in just over an hour. It was close enough to the city to take a day trip and go exploring, but far enough away that you're not dealing with Tokyo's crowds all the time. Plus, Shizuoka Prefecture is the home of Mount Fuji, and I could even see it from the top floor of my school on some days. All in all, I really lucked out with my placement. Anyway, after our prefecture orientation, some of the staff from my school came and picked me up to drive me over to my new apartment. It wasn't anything terribly fancy, but it was a small apartment that had all the essentials. And by a stroke of luck, my contract overlapped a bit with my jet predecessor, the person I was replacing, so she was nice enough to help me out with a lot when I was first getting settled in showing me around the school, teaching me how the buses worked, and some other basic stuff, which I definitely needed because even with her guidance, I still messed up a bunch. I don't know if she'll ever see this video, but on the off chance that she does, thank you so much. I owe you my life, seriously. <laughs> so the way the JET program works is that they time the arrival of new teachers to intersect with the Japanese summer vacation. That way, new hires get a chance to acclimate for a few weeks and get the culture shock out of their system before you actually start having to teach class. So I got a few weeks of going into work every day, familiarizing myself with the school and meeting the faculty, even a couple of students who came in over the break. And then once August was over and the students returned to class, it was time to actually start doing my ding dang job. But we're gonna talk about that in the next video because that's all the time we have for this one. I warned y'all at the start this was gonna be a series. Don't make that face of me. So next time, stories from the trenches of being an English teacher abroad. Look forward to it. So I'll be going into more stories from my time actually teaching on the next one. I don't know when that's going to come out exactly, but I want to try and alternate my story times and art related videos for a while and see how that works. So part two coming soon-ish, eventually, when I feel like it. Also, the art in the background of this video is some Witch Hat Atelier fan art I drew recently. It'll be up in my shop soon, but it hasn't released just yet, so keep an eye on my store for the next launch. They'll probably be releasing sometime in June. Also, read Witch Hat Atelier, it's so freaking good. Lastly, special thanks to my pal, the Jaycorn, for lending me his voice in the video. He's a DM of our D&D series, What's Left of Us, and if you've ever been in one of my art streams, you've probably heard me either yelling at him or about our show, so go watch our show, What's Left of Us, and subscribe to Jay's channel. Links for that down in the description. Okie day, that's all for today. Thanks for listening, and I will talk to you guys again soon. Bye.